you want to get on the action, we want to hear from you. Hit us up, faderoutemail at gmail.com. Slide in our DMs on IG at Fade Route Podcast. Drop us a DM on Twitter at Fade Route DNZ. Comment on our YouTube channel, The Fade Route with DNZ. Questions, comments, picks, segment suggestions, you name it, we want to hear from you. Get at us, in crowd. It's the in route where friends of the show get a special segment with us. Want to be part of the action? Want to be the newest member of the in crowd? You know what to do. Hit us up, faderoutemail at gmail.com or slide in those DMs on Fade Route Podcast on IG or hit that Twitter, Fade Route DNZ. Joining us on the in route this evening is our World Cup correspondent, owner, and designer of FCK Clout Apparel, New York City realtor, and vlogger extraordinaire, Gil Godoy. Thanks for coming on, Gil. Hey, how are you guys? How What's are up, you? G? What's going on? Fantastic. So, I mean, you partied in the hotel bars, you drove the deserts of the Middle East, and stepped foot in the Persian Gulf. What was your overall impression of Qatar? I mean, to be honest, I don't know if it was a setup or not, but I mean, it, it was it was beautiful. I mean, Lucille Boulevard. I mean, you got to keep in mind for the last 10 years, they built Lucille section of, of Doha. So everything was modern. Their train system looked like a spaceship. They had actually no conductors on the train. It was all self-automated. They only had... What? Yeah, they, and I have footage that of it. It, wild. Looked, it looks like a spaceship. They're... they're their tra- their cards came from Japan because I, I looked on the actual cards. Um, the front, the first cart, and the back cart, to put in perspective, were luxury cushion seat rows where you sat on like recliners, um, and you got to see out the front windows like you were driving the ship. Like if you, if I share the video footage and the photos, it, it looks fake. It looks like I'm on the set of t- Star Trek. Um, <laughs> as far as the city, completely spotless. Um, you do give that you do give a lot up when you're in the United States, but you know when you look at a country like that and you you know how beautiful it is, where you know the old meets the new, you got to say why don't we have this here? Right. Um, you got to say well they don't have an army. You know they're not spending two trillion dollars to defend that country like as we are. So you know there is a trade off. A trade off. Whether I agree with having a trillion dollar budget or not is one thing. That's a whole other conversation for Qatar. I mean, I learned a lot of things. 80% of their population there is not even original Qatarian. It's like less than 20%. Um, I didn't know that. When I got there, I didn't realize like the average income there is like $200,000 a year. Wow. All right. There's no poverty there. You'll, you'll never catch a homeless person. And next to Dubai and Abu Dhabi, which is in the Emirates to the, I would say the west of it or southwest of it. I'm, I'm sorry, southeast of it. Um, they're the safest cities in the world. You could like sit there with a million dollars and you wake up with a million dollars. Like nobody has the urge of negative. Right, but they, they also have kind of like a zero tolerance policy. Too, yeah, right? yeah, and yeah. You can't, not... <laughs> when you go there, you have to respect that. Obviously there were commentators I went there to prove a point, but I mean, that's not why you should go there. I mean, you. Yeah. I mean, it's not here, you know? Here we fight right. for freedom of speech. There they had it. I mean, for the most part, I mean, I have a loose tongue, so I will curse from time to time. Um, and to be honest with you, it was overall beautiful. The people there were nice. They were honest. I rented a car there and to drive. And, you know, the the, the return policy, they were honest. Um, you know, you got to worry about things like that when you're traveling overseas and rent a car. You know, they try to give you dummy cars and then charge you bills later on. But their roads, their roads were beautiful. Not one single pothole. Their beaches are amazing. What actually broke my heart, the one thing, was my friend and I, we drove up to the northern part of Qatar. It was an old port city. And um, we were in the Persian Gulf and it was low tide. So the, the, the water goes out like a quarter mile so you can walk the whole beach. And there were two kids there with a crab hook where they were just picking up little crabs from the sand. And you know, I, I introduced myself to wander around like they are. And I asked them where they were from. And they're like, oh, we're, we were from Algeria, but we lived here for 10 years. And when they said, where am I from? Because they see me with a massive beard and shaved head, assuming I was a local or nearby. And I said, United States, it kind of got scared. They, they looked at me with a, a face of concern. So I told them that uh, 
I'm one of the good ones. So, <laughs> <laughs> but well, you, you, so you made it to the Argentina, Mexico, and and Portugal, Uruguay matches. What was the atmosphere <laughs> in and around the stadiums, or and for those matches, and how did the supporters treat each other? So here's the thing. I, and I, for my friend who came with, he's Greek, so he had never been to a World Cup kind of game. I had been in World Cup 94. So when we went to the first game, which was the day we arrived, Mexico versus Argentina, obviously um, the Argentinians, were, their back was against the wall. They had just already lost to Saudi Arabia, and Mexico was looking for the kill. They smelled blood in the water. So right off the bat, the Mexican crowd was, through the, from the moment you woke, got off the train to went to the Lucille Stadium, which is the largest stadium in the in, out of all of them, um, it was it was pure chaos from the Mexican side. I mean, as far as energy, the, the the cheering, the chanting, the bragging, all this talk. And the Argentinians were proud. They walked, they rocked their colors. They had their chance for Messi and the Vamos Argentina chant that you'll probably hear on TikTok a lot right now. And but we kept it quiet until the second half because that's when they started scoring and then that's when the Argentinians started chanting and going nuts and the Mexicans kind of got quiet. Uh, <laughs> and then I told my friend, because I said, listen, in two days, we're going to see Portugal versus Uruguay and they're similar to how Argentinians are our games. We don't talk trash until we have a purpose to. So when we went to the Uruguay and Portugal game, it was a lot calmer until you started scoring and then one side started cheering and one side started ranting. That's when it started getting loud. But the atmosphere with a Mexican crowd against Argentina was way different. It was like a nine on the Richter scale, and the Portugal and Uruguay was like a four. You know, the energy levels are too different. But um, gotcha. It, it was pretty, <laughs> it was still fun overall. Now let's get to the big one. Argentina got out ahead early, but France was able to equalize before Argentina finally took it home in penalty kicks. Set the emotion aside. Was this the best World Cup final of all time? So if I'm setting the emotion aside, it could be argued. Why I say that, there is one more World Cup game that I think went in. It was the Brazil against Argentina. I mean, Brazil against Italy, rather. And Baggio missed the penalty. That, to me, was also a crucial game. If I'm not... That was, nine, that was 94, right? Yeah. That that final there, I don't know if you can consider the... As far as intensity and highlights, this one clearly takes the cake. Uh, as far as... Um, just talent again they're pretty well balanced then you had Baggio on one side Ronaldo on another you had South America against Europe so they're kind of both balanced out but for me I loved this one for a lot of reasons if I took myself out of being biased Argentina the fact that they both scored in extra time each wild 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 absolutely insane um that and was Bob, and then Mbappe really Doing yeah, everything he could. Man. And like, see, I, I told you when they were up two nothing, I said Argentina needs to score at least four goals to close it out. <laughs> and then they tied the game within minutes of that text, within in a two minute window. So I knew France wasn't dead yet. Europe Europeans play a different way than South Americans do, and you saw it. You saw it in that game. Completely different types of style, and um, that's what you saw. That to me, I would still put this one as number one, but I would put Brazil and Italy number two. No, that's, that's very fair. That's definitely very fair. This was a fantastic game, and the you know the stars came out to shine. You know, and that's what I think. That's one of the things that's most important is that they didn't shrink in the moment. But nope. Now that the World Cup has come and gone, and you know, I know you're a soccer historian, and you got you like to debate who the greatest of all time is, and you're. You know, Pele is also a personal friend of the family. Yeah. So, you know, he's, he's actually spending Christmas in the hospital. ESPN just yeah. broke that story. Yeah. So uh, our thoughts go out to Pele, and hopefully he's okay. But, um, you know, has the Messi-Ronaldo GOAT debate finally been settled? And are we on to something new and better with this Messi and Mbappe rivalry? Well, I think what happened now was a couple of things. Um, I, as an Argentinian... Eight years ago, when we were in the finals, Messi, people forget, was now a villain to us because he didn't win the game. And the the, comp the country kind of turned their back on him for a little bit because, you know, we came off of losing the Copa America and all that to Chile, then that, and then he quits right afterwards. You know, a lot of he, he showed a lot of emotions that we're not used to seeing from our top stars. You know, after Maradona, we went to... 
let's say Palmero, and from Palmero, who was a, a, a boss on the national level, on the club level, he was great, boss on the national level. Then we went to Ortega, who was also number a number ten guy, Ortega. Then when he didn't really do so well, then we went to Treves. Who really didn't do so well. He couldn't carry the throne. Then when we had this kid Messi, who was overlooked originally from the, the Argentinian squad, we 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 put him on this pedestal and said enough's enough. And if you're gonna do the accolades on the club level, why aren't you doing them on the national level? That's why even me, when we lost to France, and you know, I said to myself, he doesn't have it in him to carry a team. He needs a team. And this coach who played with him 12 years ago knew that. So now we look at the goat conversation do i personally think he's one of the goats yes um because i can never call you a goat until you win at least one world cup you're not even in my conversation so you win that i don't care what you do on a club level it's the national flag is what you do and Mbappe, on the other hand will carry the throne but will they be good next world cup compared to this one no they won't make the finals next world cup they won't um my my thought would be either brazil or england those are my calls now um are going to make the finals. But Mbappe is great, and he'll be good and great. I don't see him winning the next World Cup or another one at this point. Because he, he, to me, is like the Randy Johnson of baseball. He relies on the fastball. He is great, and he impacts the, the game. But in time, he's going to play, by now to the next World Cup, he's going to play almost a, like another 500 club games. And he's going to run at 20 miles to 23 miles an hour. He's going to have another flock of 19-year-olds behind him. He's going to be, what, 20, 27? Yeah, 28, 28, 28. 28. So you've got to ask yourself, how much... Look at Ronaldo on the club level was doing well. He had the same attributes as Mbappe. He's just an inch shorter, maybe. Same attributes. But even he sort of to slow down afterwards at that age. I mean, on a club level, he was he was great statistically. But on a national scale, he was okay. I mean, he won... The Euro Cup one time, but that's about it. He never got any further advancement in the World Cup. So I don't see Mbappe being the next GOAT. Do I think he's the face of soccer right now? Yeah, because of his age. But Brazil has a lot of wildfire uh, guys that are talented that got embarrassed and now know what it is to be humble. And I see them coming. I see England coming. And um, I said, I was looking for, I was favoring England to come out aggressive this World Cup because they're just a bunch of 19 year olds. And they don't have a Rooney. They don't have a Beckham which is great. You don't need that in this generation soccer. You need a team. And, and Argentina if you, look at, if you look at England, if you look at England, it's literally everybody on the team starts in the EPL. Yeah. Everybody, everybody in the starting lineup. Yeah, it's you insane. see, what, what the Argentinian coach did differently when he took over the reins when he was testing this formula for three years was half the team is from the South American leagues and half the team is basically from the European leagues but he took the overpaid players, the Iwains and the Agueros off the team because they couldn't finish. If you notice in the last World Cup, every time Messi put the ball in their feet, they couldn't finish. And the World Cup, when we went to the finals, they just couldn't put the ball in the net against Germany. Iwain supposedly got an offside. That's the only goal I can remember him attempting, and it was an offside. But what they did with Messi was they supported him with Dabala. Dabala played, what, like five minutes? But he plays that same role. So now Dabala has his experience going into the next World Cup, knowing exactly what Messi's role was this World Cup, and he's going to mimic it now. And they rewarded him with a penalty in the finals, so he's good. But now you have McAllister, you got the front two uh, forward, then you've got uh, the, the Paula on the other side, who's okay. To me, he's metacore, but he brings the tenacity. He's like your Dennis Rodman. And then you've got a defense that actually plays defense. The last two World Cups, the Argentine defense was just old men who got paid well in Europe and thought they were really good. But then they gave up so many goals to Croatia in the box. You know, this team didn't want you in that box at all. So what he usually do, he played four back. And then he put four in the midfield. He didn't want you back there. He didn't want the other team in that box. So he put it in the midfield. So he knew exactly how to build a team around him that were young, that can compete in the next World Cup. I wouldn't be surprised if Argentina becomes an upset team in the next one. With or without Messi, they can upset a lot of teams. Absolutely can. And the, the Argentinian defense, like, I watched I watched the 2014 World Cup with you. Yeah. And we watched the Argentina game and compared them to this team. The, this Argentinian team smothered France early yeah. on. Like, yeah. it was amazing. This team was kill, was to punch, bite, and kill first. 
and then tire them out with the possession. Where normally we kill you a possession first and try to score later. No, they were trying to go out every game. They try to score first and fast and often. That's why their shots on goal were probably a lot higher this World Cup than the last two. Um, and they were just more efficient with the ball. They play more tactical, what I would call triangle offense in this World Cup than ever before. And then this to me defines what Messi and Argentina was good at. The second goal with France. When the defender takes the ball from the French forward and sends it to Messi in the midfield, the guy on the lower half of the screen, you would probably see on the right side midfielder, comes to, he stutters or he hesitates to attack Messi. But what Messi does right there in the blink of an eye is he touches the ball, then passes. Instead of just doing a one touch, he does a two touch. Messi, knowing that his forward's going to run up that line, he touches the ball, which then at that moment makes that midfielder commit to attack him then flicks it up the field to him to his forward which then runs down the field to then shift it over to Di Maria if he never touched it that second time that midfielder would have stuck with that forward and that play would never exist but if you slow that move up that literally defines how technically sound this team was they knew exactly what he was going to do at all times so they anticipated that two touch move and they knew exactly when to cut they knew exactly when that midfielder was going to commit it's crazy if you didn't see it in live time, but Messi touches that ball twice to stop it and flick it up the line. And it, it blows your mind because when you see it in slow motion and you see it in real time, you're like, I just can't believe I witnessed that. And that one move or two moves defines how that team was playing that whole World Cup. Step outside of your safe area and make a statement without saying much with FCK Clout Lifestyle Apparel. Embrace the colorful chaos and stay emotionally regulated in their hoodies, snapbacks, graphic tees, accessories, and more. Season 3 merch is up now. Get it while you can. Go to fckclout.com and get all of your needs from men and women. That's fckclout.com. Yeah, they were playing. Uh, they were playing some of the best football I've ever seen, and they were just playing very like it was very tactical. Like you said, the best way to describe it is tactical. But we're going to transition from football to American football. Yeah, buddy. So your New York Giants, my New York Giants, they're eight five and one after beating the Commanders with a little bit of questionable fishing. Yeah, the end. Who seriously. Cares? They're poised to make the playoffs right now, and who would have thought that was coming? But. What's their ceiling this year, and do they need to bring in Odell Beckham Jr. to reach it? No, they don't need Odell Beckham. Would it be great to have him? Probably, but to be honest with you, I don't see it happening. I, I think he's going to command too high of a price tag for what his value is. He hasn't had a complete season in so long, and he's had two devastating injuries. It's not like they were sprained ankles. This man has torn ligaments, and he's not a six foot four wide receiver. He's a five foot nine guy. So unless he's coming in, taking a veteran's minimum kind of deal and running the slot to replace the old Shepard, so be it. But we don't need deep bomb threats like him. And I don't need three finger catches in the end zone. What we do need is a bruiser in the back line to beat up the D on the running side. Because Saquon is not the, the, the bruiser, you know. I'm, I'm used to seeing Brandon Jacobs and a short, much, uh, Bradshaw. I love that type of running game. I love Saquon, but if we keep him, we need to draft. That, and I'm all applying to the draft game because this year is a unicorn year for the Giants. I don't know how many people are aware of this, but like the Giants' payroll was like zero compared to the rest of the league. We had some really ugly contracts because of our last ownership of management. So this new coach didn't have a lot to work with. And to pull off more than, I would have said, more than three games, I would have called it. If you and I sat in a bar, Z, like we used to do and, and pick out the playoffs for the NBA. Like if we did this with the Giants, <laughs> I would have said the Giants were lucky if they got three to four games this year. So the fact that we got eight and we can make the playoffs, that just makes this draft a lot better to look at because we can replace a lot of good contracts with a lot of young players that can do the same exact thing for cheaper and probably get an Odell just for fun. But do we need him? Not necessarily. No, I think we have enough. Anybody can catch at his height right now. And the guys are only coming out younger and faster out of college. So I'd rather just recruit a guy that does a similarity and I get him on a rookie contract in the yeah, third round. 
the best way that it, unicorn is the best way to describe this because right now they're in line to face the Niners in the first round and Brock Purdy or not like that's that's not a good matchup for for the Giants in the playoffs so yeah and, and to be honest the Giants defense hasn't been lined up together all for one game I think this year and it was like two weeks or weeks ago where we don't know our full capabilities yet because we don't have them up there and you know, Saquon's doing his thing. I think we have to change our field. I'm not a big fan of what they're doing on that field. It's terrible. Um, but Odell Beckham, to me, is a high-risk, low-reward player. And he always was. I never saw him as a top receiver. Outside of that one catch in Dallas and maybe two a year later, all he was, he was too much of a negative energy to the team. He was a distraction. I mean, hell, he brought him to Miami the day before game. <laughs> you know, last playoff game. Oh. <laughs> you know, so both games. There, there's no, there's, to me, if I'm a manager, I, I don't see no upside to that. Bringing in a 30 plus year old man with two bucks in knee, <laughs> thinking he could run a 4 2 40 when he really can't. But I can go into college right now and say I can get about two of those in the fourth round for like pennies to the dollar. And what is he commanding out? So he's get, still getting paid our Giants contract, right? At 18, 19 million a year. He's, uh, he's on the Giant contract through a couple different teams. Yeah. So I don't know who the hell's paying. I think the Rams At this point, like this everybody one. is, is divvying up. But I mean, the Giants, this season's a unicorn season. I didn't expect them to get more than three to four games. And I knew they were going to be the bottom of the totem pole. And I didn't even think the Redskins were going to do that great. I thought we were both going to be in the bottom. But I mean, I'll take 10 wins. Because I think we have a chance of, depending on the quarterback for the Eagles, depending on how his, how his arm is, if the next couple of teams can still hit him when he comes back. I know he's not playing this week, but he's playing the following week. If they can hit his arm, <laughs> I said the Eagles can't operate without him. So I'm like, the Giants have a chance of putting him out, you know, at least bruising him into the playoffs. Yeah, no, totally. And uh, it's it's within the realm of possibility. They're better. The Giants are better than the Colts. And yeah. the Colts put 33 on the Vikings in the first half, and the Giants get the Vikings this weekend. So it is, 10 wins is actually really within the realm of possibility. But we'll get you out of here on this one, G. Cool. We know you're a diehard Met fan. Correct. I've been to games with you. Like we've had spirited debates yep. about the Mets, and Uncle Stevie is going crazy. crazy. They lost the Grom, they lost Bassett, they lost Walker, but they brought in Verlander, Senga, Quintana, and now Carlos Correa <laughs> at like three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, like, that's I, insane. It's like I went to the bathroom to check and I checked my phone. I'm like, what the? Well, why? How is Carlos Correa a Met? What is this? This is kind of a sick joke. Yep. So grade the off season so far, and do the move, do they still need to make moves for that to, to for them to go over that top, or like yeah. is Correa it? I like all he's doing, and I appreciate an owner in New York that's finally willing to put their money where their mouth is. Since George Steinbrenner, who was always a villain, and I'm not even a Yankee fan, he would at least put his money up a time to time. He was probably the only owner in New York that would actually do it because a Will Ponds wouldn't. We know uh, what's his name. The Knicks owner wouldn't do it. Oh, God. Or if he did, it'd be for a guy like Amari who had like two blown out knees and no health insurance. But going back to the Mets, this guy's willing to put a half a billion dollars in two months on this team. So he's at least saying to the management, I did my part. You got to do your part. I think the best thing this team can do right now, the Mets, is all meet up at, you know, spring training and keep their mouths shut. Don't create any attraction to you and just perform on the field that's all you can do because the last two seasons they've won 100 games respectively let's say and then they choked and they're just basically back to the same routine of there's always next year they're still on that that road because i'd rather you win 75 games to win me a world series than win me 100 and get and then lose first place and don't even make this <laughs> the playoffs so don't get my hopes up with half a billion dollars if you're not going to perform. And I think that's what's going to matter the most now. Because the media is waiting. The media is waiting to talk to these players now and start, you know, stressing them out. Verlander, we're going to see. I mean, can he deal with New York? I mean, Randy Johnson couldn't. A lot of pitchers came into New York and couldn't deal with New York. And granted, we're in Queens. It's a little different. But still, it's the media that's that's not. Losing to Grom is not a big deal to me. Honestly, if you're going to tell me right now, that the Mets gave up DeGrom and got a, a, a solid starting five in return, then I'll take that. Because when DeGrom was here, he played how many games? And how much were we paying him? Yes, I love his Cy Young. I love all that. But what good are you if you're not around, you know? 
and he believes he's going to win somewhere else, good for you. He deserves the money. Go to Texas, get the tax-free money. If you keep believing this sixth or eighth place team is going to win a World Series tomorrow, good for you. Uh, <laughs> but you're not. I have no animosity towards him. He deserves it. New York wasn't his thing. And I genuinely believe that he just didn't want his family being raised in New York. I think that was the thing. With everything coming happening in New York, I just genuinely believe he didn't want his family in New York anymore. And that's why he chose. There was no beef. There was nothing. He just said, I want out. He got out when he did. And the Mets, we have a new owner at the right time. And he just said, here's the checkbook. Go nuts. Like a Disney movie. And I think that as long as they all keep their mouths shut and stay out of trouble, the, Nick, the, the Mets, rather, can go far. I mean, we're going to see from, you know, we only have a couple months till spring training. Yeah, so. I, I, I'm gearing to make some Mets hats and go to spring training in Tampa with them eventually. I got to design my Argentina championship hats, and then I'm going to design some Mets hats for this season where I want to actually go down and create some content for the new season two. Because I go to DR in January, the first week, and then right around the corner is that. So I want to be ready for that and be able to hand out some hats up to the players. Like, I'm, I'll spend a weekend in Tampa and just do that. So that will be one of my to-dos this year, is to go to Tampa, see this new team. Because I've never been. And I want to see what this team's all about. I mean, if you're wasting half a billion dollars, you know those ticket prices are going to be crazy. We're not going to see no more of those free shirt Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. That's, I those ticket prices, have, I mean, those jerseys are going to have to be paid somehow. So um, $5 upper deck for, uh, tickets. Wednesday nights, those are gone. So, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what we always did. I mean, we always bought the upper decks and just stayed in the, in the liquor area. But, I mean, the, the good tickets, I don't, I won't be, I mean, he has to figure a way to make money back. So, when you spend a half a billion dollars in two months, there, there has to be a business move to make that money back. And you're not going to get it back in just jersey sales. The Mets fans aren't like that, where we're just going to buy a, a, you know, a Verlander shirt tomorrow. Other no, guys fans make, are cynical. Yeah, you know, like he's only here for two years too. So right now our guys about win right now. And I don't blame them. The Dodgers are doing it. The Giants are trying to do it. The Phillies are trying to do it. It's a win right now mentality. A lot of sports in general just like that win right now. We don't have time to just rebuild, especially in football too. It's not, you don't have time for rebuilds. You can't predict the future and injuries. You got to win right now. <laughs> you can tell me right now. And you're winning right now. So the OG, Trying. Triple G. <laughs> now nah, you're doing, man. Trying. You were at the World Cup. That was I know that was a goal of yours and you made it happen. Yeah, that so. was about five years in the making. That was not cheap by any means. <laughs> that, by no means. When I look at hard work expenses, pays off, brother. Yeah, I appreciate it, but that that was an experience. I tell you, man. I mean, I don't know how the Americas are going to hold up. I'll be honest with you. If all of the Middle East could just hold World Cups, do it because the way they hold the crowd control, the tra the train track, like everything was controlled. Like it was never. You, like I have a video on one of my blogs where eighty thousand of us are going to the train station, and they had it in such a controlled way. That it, outside of just bumping into each other because you want to talk to everybody, I mean, there was just entertainment and distractions. You just didn't feel like you were taking a train. Like, you just felt like you were getting on an awesome Disney ride, the train itself. It, it was just like these Middle East countries just know how to operate. And I just don't see, I just don't see our stadiums. I, I won't speak for Mexico because I know that's going to be an experience. I'm already planning my Mexico trip. I don't care which groups are there, I'm going to Mexico. But I can't see Dallas holding a hunt because right now they're saying they're going to hold the final because he what what did Jerry Jones put up like another three hundred million dollars of renovations for the World Cup? Yeah. So I can't see Giant Stadium holding eighty nine thousand people and there's not violence outside. And to be honest with you, the no liquor in the stadiums I think had a huge, huge impact on the game because when Argentina went up one nothing. And then 10 minutes later, we went up 2 nothing. The Mexicans, they were violent. They were aggressive verbally, and they wanted to start fights. They got into fights with themselves at one point outside the city. Like, there's video footage somewhere on TikToks when I saw some. I mean, there were a lot of guys ready to fight us Argentinians, and we were ready to go. But at the end of the day, you know, cool heads presided. But if there was liquor involved, could you imagine when Morocco beat Belgium? Belgians would have gone nuts. When, you know, England... It, tied with us they would i was in abu dhabi waiting for the flight the connecting flight they would have gone nuts if there was liquor involved unfortunately as much as i used to love drinking that was a huge factor in it too there was nobody was drunk coming out and starting fights like viciously like it was once the game was over kind of sucked for if you lost but then you kind of let it go 
where, where if you have liquor involved, it's a whole different ball game. So, to be honest with you, not having liquor in the stadiums is a huge, and most people won't agree. They won't like to hear that. But if you're bringing kids to these events, yeah, you're, you're not going to want a group of like any other countrymen going nuts, you know? It's, it's you know, think about it. If you have a, a daughter or a son, first experience in America to watch it. My first experience at a World Cup game was at Foxborough Stadium against Nigeria, Maradona's last game before he got the drug bust. And uh, luckily we won, so there wasn't violence. <laughs> but <laughs> look what happened if you were, I watched USA beat Columbia and I was in Jackson Heights, Queens in a, in a Uruguayan restaurant. You know, my father told me like, listen, keep your mouth shut when we go outside because the Colombians are not happy. You know, it, it, it can get that way. <laughs> so not having liquor at these stadiums was a huge deal in, in, in a positive way. Kids got to enjoy it. And I must admit, I've never seen a stadium accommodate so many uh, handicapped people. I didn't even know that was an option in stadiums, to be honest with you. But they had flat sections, elevators assigned, people who would usher you into bathrooms with your, I guess, family or partner or parent. But they would like, their accommodation for people that were couldn't walk or and look it was, ama- was utterly amazing. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And the subways were free. Subways were absolutely, they were all free. That's, wow. Yeah. So, that, and I'm, I can't wait for the next part. I've seen most of the vlogs. I'm, I gotta get on the last, the last episode. But last one was one, long, but it was worth yeah, it. It is. I mean, they've been fantastic, man. And if you haven't checked it out, go to Fuck Cloud's YouTube page. Go there. You'll see the vlogs. They're fantastic. They're shot on a GoPro. It's like, you know, it's very well done, very well edited. And the OG Triple G, Gil Godoy, yes. the owner, designer of Fuck Cloud Apparel. Thank you yes. for coming on, brother. Thank no you for being problem. A part of Thank the you for the in-crowd. invite. Of Thank course. And invite. if you want to be a member of the in crowd, hit us up at faderoutemail at gmail.com. Slide in those DMs at Fade Route Podcast on IG. Or hit us up on Twitter at FadeRouteDNZ. Brother, have a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. We got to get together. We got to have a drink or two. We got to we gotta watch some sports, man. Let me know, it's been man. too long. This it's weekend, long. let me know if you're free. Not for drinks, just to hang out. It don't have to be drink related. But I got to stop by the Hibernia because, you know, they were big Argentina fans. So I got to stop by there. Yeah, I saw Eddie was uh, Eddie was repping your uh, your brand, so we definitely gotta we gotta swing by there and, and say yeah. hi. I'll be free if you're free this weekend. I know it's the holiday, the twenty third. Wait, what's this weekend land on? Uh, Friday's the twenty third. Oh, uh, that's Christmas. I didn't remember. I, I lost train of uh, time of thought, but usually if I do go out, it's on on a Saturday because Monday through Fridays I'm just working and working out. So, um, but yeah, let me know. I, I on January the first week of January I'm in DR, and then I come back. If it's after that, so be it. But uh. You know I'm available. Yes, sir, brother. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for coming on, man. And no we'll problem. talk to you soon. You got it, guys. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to this episode of our podcast. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Rate us five stars. Leave us a review. Turn on subscription notifications. And tell your friends. Spread the word. Spread it wide.